and good morning. I want to welcome you to live Bible study from Karis Bible College and Andrew Womack Ministries. My name is Julianne Harris and I'm your host this morning. So let's just go ahead and get started. We want you to interact with us. And how can you interact? Well, whatever forum you're watching in, we want you to go down to the chat section and as questions come to your heart, um, we want you to type those questions in. And actually you can get started right now just by letting us know where you're from. Type in where you're from and say hello and let's get started with this interaction this morning. So how it's gonna go down is um, about the last 10 to 15 minutes, we're gonna get to as many questions as we possibly can. So uh, we want you to interact. In order for you to interact, you need to know when we're live. So on Mondays and Fridays, we uh, go live at 10 a.m. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's at 6 p.m. And bright and early, Wednesday morning is at 7 a.m. And that is all mountain time. So please calculate out the time so that you can tune in live and submit your questions and interact with us. We love, love, love that. Um, also, this is a viewer-supported live Bible study. It's only brought to you through the partners and the gifts that come to Andrew Womack Ministries. So I would encourage you to pray about becoming a partner. And there's a few ways you can give. You can go to awmi.net slash give or you can give us a call um, actually if you're watching on Facebook below the video is a donate button you can click on that and give that way otherwise you can give us a call at 719-635-1111 also when you give us a call to become a partner uh, we have prayer ministers available to you and whether or not you want to become a partner uh, we have prayer ministers available to you who can direct you towards the word of God. They can direct you to Andrew's over 200,000 hours of free material on his website. You guys, we're going through a day and an age right now that is a little bit unprecedented and you may be going through something that you've never gone through before, but don't worry. Uh, we're here to pray with you and stand in agreement with you because God is a good God and he knows right where you are. And so don't hesitate. If you're going through something, call them right now at 719-635-1111. So those are all my announcements. I like to hustle through as quickly as I can so we can get to as much of the amazing teaching that we're going to receive today. And so today we get to hear from Daniel Amstutz. Yay. <laughs> um, and so let me go over his titles because, you know, I'm a, I like to go over everybody's titles in case you're not aware of the many hats that most employees wear here at the ministry. Um, and Daniel, so Daniel's titles are, he's director of Karis Worship Arts. So any worship that you see going out of Karis Bible College, um, that is Daniel. He is the director of it. Um, and once school gets back in, we will be having live worship coming to you on Mondays and Wednesday mornings. Uh, tune in for that. So Daniel's the head of that. He's also the director of the third year worship arts school. And that's just the third year track of specifically into worship and everything that has to go has to do with worship in the new covenant. Praise God. And then also he is the director of healing school. And so we were just talking this morning that healing is here conference is coming up. Mm -hmm. And that's August 10th through the 13th. That's right. Is that yep. what you said? Yes. So he's the director of yeah. that. So uh, I know he's a favorite here on Live Bible Study. And um, so we're ready for whatever you're bringing us today. Amen. Thank you, Hallelujah. Julianne. Yes. It's good to be back. Um, yes. Today's my first day back from a week of vacation. And uh, man, it's just great. We had uh, our summer family Bible conference. Mm -hmm. And then right after that, uh, we took a week of vacation. And so uh, it's really good to be back again. And thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I've been thinking about something that's been on my heart for a while now. So we're gonna get into it today. And I've entitled this, Who You Bow To Is Who You Will Serve. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna talk about that and how that actually works in us and through us since we are a three-part being. So let's get into the Word of God. God again today. Amen? Amen. Jesus gave us a commandment and he said that we must worship in spirit and in truth. And many people don't realize that this isn't something optional. It's actually the only way for us to be able to worship God. And Jesus made that very clear in John chapter four, when he said, those who worship the father must worship in spirit and in truth. But we don't really understand typically what that looks like on a day to day basis. And uh, it's interesting because when you realize that living from the new covenant is really a place where we live today as a living sacrifice. 
Amen? Amen. And so Jesus gave us the ability through his life in us to be able to be surrendered to the will of God and to have our lives be literally a living sacrifice. And so today we are worshiping God from a new covenant, which is worshiping from the inside out, as we've talked about many times on our live Bible studies versus living from the outside in like they had to in the old covenant because no one had the presence of God actually living in them yet. So this becomes something that is really a game changer for us in our lifetimes right now. But I'm telling you, this is also something that the enemy is absolutely furious over. The fact that we have the spirit of God living in us. And we're gonna talk about why when we bow to something or to someone, why it's the process of serving as a result that comes out of that and why that is so important. So the enemy, as we're gonna to discover today, does not want us to know our identity. He does not want us to know that we are created in the image of God and that what we actually have been given in our generation today and now for over 2000 years is so much better than what anyone had in the old covenant. That's why Jesus said the new covenant is a better covenant with better promises. And I can assure you there is a better way to live. Amen. And the enemy absolutely does not want us to know what that's all about, especially as we break it down practically in our day to day, not just from conference to conference or from event to event, or even to just hold it as a theology or a philosophy, but to really make it something that's practical in our lives in the day to day. So he would love for us to not know our identity and he would love for us to not know our authority. But guess what? What he goes after is our worship. Hmm. It's true. What he goes after is our worship. And I want to just encourage you, you're seeing on the lower thirds of your screen right now, my new book that's just been recently released called The Place of His Presence. And if you don't have it yet, I really want to invite you to get it because I go into this in detail. But today we're going to talk about this because the enemy knows that who you bow your life to is who you are going to serve. Let's look at it out of Psalms 48. We're going to look at several different scriptures here this morning because how many know this is a live Bible study? <laughs> so again, Julianne said at the top of our live today, if you've got questions that come up while we're teaching, please send those to us. We'd love to hear from you and love for you to be interactive with us. And we love being interactive with you. Amen. Let's get into it though. Psalm, uh, Psalm 48 verse one says, great is the Lord. He is greatly to be praised. Notice he's not just to be praised, but he's what? He's greatly to be praised. And he is the one who is in you, okay? So when we say great is the Lord, uh, he's the one who's in us today. And guess who he is? He's great. He's not just great out in the atmosphere somewhere. No, he's great in you and greatly to be praised. So this means that he is not only great in you, but let's look at another scripture here out of 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, which you probably already know, but I wanted to stir you up by way of remembrance today. Greater is he that is in you than what? He who's in the world. So not only is God great, but he's greater than he who is in the world. Now, again, we know this, but you know what? When we get into our challenges uh, in our day to day, sometimes it's easy to forget the fact that God is great and he's greater in us than what's trying to come against us. Amen. Sometimes what's trying to come against us is like what uh, David experienced when fighting Goliath. Goliath was huge and he was this giant that seemed so impossible to defeat. But David had a different image that he got from the Lord God. And because he was seeing that circumstance differently, he was able to, through the ability of God, slay that giant. Amen. And God wants us to know today that even in the midst of all that's happening globally with coronavirus, with the political and economic upheaval, all the different changes that are happening in our lifetime right now, greater is he 
that's in us than he that is in the world. Amen. Amen. So Zephaniah uh, 3 and verse 17, this is an Old Testament scripture, obviously, but I want to uh, read this this morning in the King James. I usually use the new King James, but this is in the King James version. And it says this, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Hallelujah. Where? The Lord is mighty, but he's mighty in the midst of thee. Amen. He will save and he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love and he will joy over thee with singing. This is the God that we serve who is absolutely for us. And the Bible says that if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Amen. Nothing's going to separate us from the love of God unless we let it. And so the enemy doesn't want us to know that God in us is mighty, that he's not only greater, but he's, he's mighty in the midst of us and that God is actually singing over us. He's dancing over us. He's rejoicing over us with joy because he knows how great he is in us. But he wants us to discover that. And again, the enemy absolutely is fighting against us to steal, kill, and destroy that image and that identity to where we think we are the defeated ones and we are the victims instead of the victors. Praise God. So Jesus gave us all authority over the enemy, all, over all the power of the enemy. And the enemy knows it, but again, he doesn't want you to know it. So let's look at this out of Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. Jesus says, behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents. Notice he's giving us what? Authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over, watch it, all the power of the enemy, that nothing by any means shall hurt you. I did an extensive study in the Greek and I discovered that the word all means all. <laughs> God's given us all authority, all power over the enemy. Amen. To where he says nothing by any means will hurt you. Daniel, well, the enemy does doesn't want us to know that. What does nothing mean in the Greek? It means nothing. Oh, wow. so <laughs> Can profound. you imagine? I just wanted to make sure. I know, okay. right? Yes. Just to make sure that we're actually theologically correct here. <laughs> <laughs> because when we get into these situations, we often say, oh, wait a minute, but I think this might be the exception. Yeah. You know, the enemy uh, through our thought processes and through maybe past experiences uh, will try to get us to believe something less than what the word of God declares in our lives. Yeah. But God made provision for us in every area long before the problem ever showed up. Isn't that awesome? Yes. The provision has always been available long before the problem. So the psalmist David in Psalm 23 and verse five, you know, this famous Psalm, if you will, one of the most famous of all the Psalms, but he says in Psalm 23, verse five, that God has prepared a table for us, even in the presence of our enemies, even in the presence of the enemy, God provided and prepared a table with the provision. So even the enemy knows our provision. He just doesn't want you to know it. And God provided it even in the midst of the enemy. Amen. Amen. So the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. We know that from John 10, 10 and other scriptures as well, right? He wants to destroy us. He wants to kill us. He wants to defeat us. But God has given us this provision that is absolutely greater and was there first long before any challenges, any storms, any problems in our lives have ever risen. So let me ask you a question. Why do you think that worship is such a big deal? Why is the enemy fighting so hard to stop us from worshiping in spirit and in truth? Well, let's look at it. Um, I'm going to paraphrase here because of time. But if you are taking notes from our live Bible study today, I want you just to jot down two scripture passages. We're not going to break them open by going through all the verses because it would take us a couple hours to do so, honestly. But out of Isaiah chapter 14, here's one of the chapters, Isaiah, the old covenant prophet, uh, chapter 14, and then also Ezekiel, another prophetic voice from the old covenant in chapter 28. Both of these chapters are really uh, instrumental in unpacking what I'm about to say here. But 
these two passages talk about how the enemy was once equipped in heaven before he fell, when he was still Lucifer, before he became Satan, when he was still Lucifer, uh, he was quite the created angelic being, let me tell you. And, and we discover a lot of it from these two chapters out of scripture, additional verses as well, but these two chapters in particular. And one of the things the Bible says about him when he was uh, still Lucifer was that he was stunning in beauty. He, was, he had precious jewels that were his skin or his covering, and he was a light bearer. So can you imagine, I mean, really for us, it's all we can do is imagine what this might have been like, because Lucifer is a light bearer, and it says that every precious stone was his covering. So if his skin looked like precious stones and light was his uh, M.O., then imagine how magnificent and how brilliant he must have been as God created him to be. So it appears that he had also the ability to make music from his very being, which is mind boggling. So do you remember when Jesus rebuked Peter by speaking to the spirit that was operating through Peter? In Matthew 12, 32, Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. And he was speaking directly to Peter when he said it. Well, he wasn't calling Peter Satan. What he was doing was he was speaking to the spirit that was operating through Peter in that moment. And this is exactly what was happening here in these two passages from Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. The spirit of God is showing us something very uh, similar because these prophetic words that were being given here uh, to these uh, two physical leaders in, in, the, in the day of Isaiah and Ezekiel, the prophet was speaking to them, but he was speaking to the spirit that was influencing them for harm and for wrong. And so th this is similar to what Jesus did with Peter in the new covenant. Uh, when he said, Satan, get behind me, uh, what we're discovering here is that even though these words were physically given to two different kings that physically existed in the old covenant, really the bigger picture here of what God was wanting to show us prophetically was the spirit that was operating behind these two physical kings. And this is where we discover much of who Lucifer was and what he used to do. And many people believe that he was a heavenly worship leader of sorts, and others believe that uh, he created uh, the music within him and might have been the orchestra or the band, as it were. We don't really specifically know from Scripture, okay? You could kind of take this either way. But regardless, without getting into the particulars of these two amazing passages, we can all agree that Lucifer was kicked out of heaven and lost his position as the anointed cherub and corrupted his beauty and became the devil, the deceiver. So can I ask you to imagine something with me just for a moment here? We know from the word of God that when Lucifer fell, uh, Jesus even said, I beheld him fall as lightning, right? When he fell, he fell as lightning and he became Satan when he fell. And at some point he ended up in the garden of Eden area because we know this from scripture. So what if Satan was able to see what was happening when God created Adam? Here's where we have to use our imagination. We don't really know for sure, but it's pretty clear when we look at this picture that he was definitely in the Garden of Eden because we know he tempted Eve and Adam as a result. So it could very well be that Satan was in the garden when God was creating his created being. We know that the enemy was probably there as that was happening. So. Watch this, heaven's former worship leader who sinned and was kicked out of heaven to the earth is now hiding in the shadows as God the creator decides the time is right for him to create mankind in his own image. So here's what God does. Are you ready for this? God reaches down into the dirt and begins to form something. The enemy isn't sure what it is as he's watching, but as God does his creative work, it's becoming obvious that God is making something that is in the image of God out of dirt. He's taken dirt 
and he's creating something from dirt. And when God breathes his breath into this creation, his creation comes alive. And even scripture doesn't say this, but I can imagine how God is saying, behold, my new worship leader. What looked like just a pile of dirt has become a creation made in the image of God that will live to glorify me. And what we do know from scripture is that God said after he created man in his own image, that what he created was not only good, but it was very good. It was very good. Now here, when we go back to these passages out of Isaiah and Ezekiel, what we also discover is that Lucifer had percussion or tambourines, wind instruments and pipes and string instruments built into his being. And remember, he was beautiful. He had splendor. But now he was about to be replaced from something that had been made out of dirt. And how could God do this? Notice when God made his new worship leader, his new creation, he gave him hands to clap or percussion, and breath to breathe, a wind instrument, and vocal cords, the new stringed instrument, and his new leader of worship would be so blessed that he could speak words that would have power and would have dominion and authority in the earth realm. Wow. Can you imagine how furious Satan must have been at this point. After all, he used to be the total sum of beauty and wisdom. He was magnificent and he's just been replaced by a lump of dirt. <laughs> oh my goodness. I just love the wisdom of God and even the humor of God Amen. to take something that was nothing but a pile of dirt yeah. and bring a brand new creation out of the dust of the earth. You know, the enemy couldn't think of anything but destroying this creation that had been made in the image of God. And his attempt to do so started with tempting Adam and Eve to disobey and give up their authority and to sin. He was after the image. He knew exactly that from the image comes the identity and from the identity comes the authority. And Satan was and is still the enemy of God as a result. So when Adam and Eve gave up their authority in the, in the realm of the earth, it was a very happy day for the enemy. He thought he had fooled God and destroyed God's creation. Little did he know that years later, there would be a supernatural birth where the son of God, the second Adam, would be born of a woman and would be 100% God and 100% man. Amen. And the enemy could not have imagined the word of God becoming flesh. Actually, no one could have except God. Then at 30 years old, watch what happens one day. As the enemy comes to Jesus, who's now 30 years old, the beloved son of God, the word made flesh, and tries to get Jesus to bow down and worship him. Why would the enemy do this? What was he after? What was the big deal about Jesus bowing down to worship him? Well, the bowing down was just simply a physical expression of something greater going on on a heart level. Now watch this. When we bow our hearts, we yield to something or someone and we literally give it access into our lives. What are you bowing down to today? Are you bowing down to fear? Are you bowing down to unbelief? There's a lot of things that are vying for our attention and our affection today, but God wants us to bow our hearts first and foremost to him. So let's look at this out of Matthew chapter four, verses one through 11. It says, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. You imagine? <laughs> now, when the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him up to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle. In other words, in Jerusalem, the pinnacle of the temple 
and said to him, again, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Can you see how image and identity here is being questioned by the enemy? For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. So here the enemy is trying to use the word against Jesus. Now let's go to verse seven, where Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again, the devil took him up to an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of this world and their glory. And he said to Jesus, all these things I will give you if, if what? If you will fall down and worship me. Wow. What on earth? Why would the one who fell from heaven ask Jesus to fall down and worship him? Because he knew that who you bow your heart to is who is going to rule in your life. He was after his authority. He was after the authority that Jesus had been given. And there is no way that he could have known that that same authority that Jesus had been given was about to be given to every true believer all over the planet. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. Thank God for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Then in verse 10, Jesus goes on to say to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship. Look at it. You shall worship the Lord, your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and angels came and ministered to him. Wow. Mm. Can you see the high priority on worship from God himself? It's not about music. It's not about the arts. It's about an authentic relationship. And we've been given a kingdom and an authority to do what Jesus did. John 14, 12 says, we're going to do the same works that Jesus did and greater still because they're going to be done all over the world now, not just in that area of the Middle East where Jesus was when he was physically in the earth. So, man, ever since Genesis, the enemy has been trying to destroy the image of God, the identity that supernaturally happens as a result of having the name of Jesus, having Christ in us, the hope of glory and the authority that we've been given in his name. Do you remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar and uh, Daniel and his three friends? Uh, it happened again and, and actually several times. If we had time this morning to unpack this, I could take you through the old covenant and show you over and over again where the enemy was trying to influence through getting people to bow down and worship him and not worship the true living God. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar did with Daniel and his three friends. And he even built an image that was quite impressive in the natural, made out of solid gold. And he said, when you hear the music, I want you, I'm, I'm commanding you, not just want you, I'm commanding you to bow down and worship the image. Well, you know what, church? The same thing is happening today. We're having a lot of people who are trying to set an agenda that's saying, I'm making a law that you're going to bow down to this agenda. I'm making a legislation that you are going to be required to do this, 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 and this. And we have to decide who are we going to bow our hearts to? Are we going to bow our lives to something other than the Lord Jesus? Or are we going to bow to the word of God? Are we going to, like Jesus say, no, Satan, I'm not bowing to any other agenda. I'm going to declare it is written and I'm going to go with the word of God. So uh, again, this mindset of the enemy is so um, prevalent. It's, he is so obsessed with being worshiped instead of Jesus and us who are created in his image, worshiping the only true God who is great and greatly to be praised. Look at this scripture out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3 and 4. Again, I wish we had more time to unpack this because this is a lot of information that I'm unloading here in these few minutes with you this morning. But look at this. Let no one deceive you by any means. It says, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin or lawlessness is revealed watch it, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God 
or that is worshiped. So here's what he does. So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the Antichrist. This is how possessed the enemy is with being worshiped, that he will one day through his influence, through his demonic influence, possess someone who is going to be uh, the man of sin or the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, who will set himself up in the temple. We know him now as the Antichrist. When we study this out, he's not Christ-like, he's Antichrist, but he's going to set himself up in the end time temple that will be rebuilt in Jerusalem to actually be worshiped as God and command that everybody else bow down to that image. Well, listen, you know what? It's going to happen again. What happened in Nebuchadnezzar's day? What happened in the Garden of Eden? I'm telling you, we have to decide who we are going to bow to because whoever we are going to bow to is who we are going to serve. So I want to wrap this up today, but let me share one last scripture. Well, actually two, okay? <laughs> and one is out of Romans 14. And it says this in verse 11 and 12, and man, I take such comfort in this. It says, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. So you know what? Here's the deal. May I make a recommendation to you? It would be much better for you to bow now than to bow later because one day, Every knee, whether believer or unbeliever, is going to bow and confess that Jesus is Lord. But let's not wait until it's too late. Let's do it now and let's bow continuously. Let's bow our hearts. Let's bow our lives to the one who is the Lord of the universe and the Lord of our hearts. And my last scripture for today is Psalm 95, verse 6, which simply says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Listen, God is the one who made you and he made you to be, you are wonderfully and fearfully made and you've been made in his image. And through the rebirth, we've been given a brand new identity. And out of that identity that we have now in Christ comes this authority to be able to live in the day to day to where we don't have to bow to somebody else's agenda. We don't have to bow to the agenda of the enemy. We can literally bow our hearts and our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and serve him as a living sacrifice. And this is what God wants for every one of us who are believers today. So Julianne, even in the midst of all the crazy that's happening right now, isn't it good to know that we don't have to be submitted to all of that, yeah. but we really have been given authority in the name of Jesus as God's worship leaders in the world today to be able to submit our hearts and our lives to him. Amen. Praise God. Yeah, that's, it's so timely. Um, and so, you know, even who you obey you are servants. Romans 6 talks about it. That's what I was thinking about. Um, you become a slave to sin yeah. and to death or obedience unto righteousness. Right. So who we choose to listen to, uh, yield ourselves to, yeah. that's really going to become masters over us, right? That's really true. I think it's interesting how just bowing to something, um, it's almost, it's like you're worshiping it. It is. Right? Yeah, because it, it happens through the, uh, through the eye gate. Yeah. It happens through the ear gate. Yeah. And it happens through the will right. to where all of these areas that are influencing our soul, yeah. spirit, soul, and body, yeah. you know, and the, the soul part of us is the part of us that's the living sacrifice. Right. We have choices all throughout our day. Are we going to choose life? Are we going to choose death? Are we going to choose, you know, what are we going to choose? Right. And so we're, we're being influenced by someone or something all the time, Always. aren't we? Yeah. yeah. Always. And that's what I think a lot of people would choose to live their life differently if they looked at it as a form of worship. Meaning, um, right. when you bow your knee to anger, yeah. you're worshiping anger. You really are. And it's influencing your heart yeah. to where you begin to think differently and feel differently yeah. as a result of that. And it that. becomes such a part of you. Yeah. 
because you're worshiping it. That's right. That's <laughs> I think right. if people could really look at it for what it is, they'd be like, whoa. Whoa, let's not do that. Right, yeah. yeah. So, and, and that's why the Bible says, you know, that if we walk in the spirit, we won't fulfill all the lust of the flesh. Amen. Or in other words, just the nature of being carnal. Right. Right? Right, absolutely. Yeah. And walking in the spirit is keeping our minds on the things of the spirit. That's so, it. Being a living sacrifice. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. Okay, so let's get to these awesome questions. Thank you guys. We'll get to as many as we can. Amen. So Wakuna on YouTube says, can we worship the Lord just by speaking in tongues when we're not sure of the right words to express ourselves, as well as praying only in tongues in times of trials? Absolutely. Yeah. Man, thank God for the ability to be able to speak in tongues, yeah. honestly, Amen. because you know what happens when we're speaking in the spirit, the Bible says that we give thanks well, uh, there's so many things that we do. We speak the mysteries of God. We edify ourselves. We encourage ourselves. And so, yes, I think that uh, worshiping God, uh, for us that are in the new covenant, man, we've been given this incredible gift, really, of the Holy Ghost living in us. And the Bible says that we can speak with the tongues of men and the tongues of angels. Hallelujah. That heavenly language that comes now as a result of the Spirit of God living in us. And you know what? I want to just encourage every one of us to be speaking in tongues more versus speaking in tongues less. We need to be doing it a lot. Amen. So Grace and Natasha kind of have similar questions. So I'll just kind of recap both of them and then Great. make it clear. So Grace on YouTube and Natasha on YouTube. But Grace says, how do we honor our parents and not bow down when they say hurtful words that are not aligned to who we are in Christ? Yeah. And also when they think we are cultic because of believing the truth. So let's just, yeah. let's keep the question uh, of Grace because it's the kind of the same as Natasha. So when your parents... Yeah come at you with hurtful words. And Natasha says, I find I'm most vulnerable in my identity when I'm attacked through other Christians. How do I deal with this? So yeah. how do you deal with when it's like your parents who you're to honor and respect? Right. And how do you deal with it with other Christians that are Absolutely. coming Absolutely. Those are both such great questions. And again, thank you for asking that. That's, yeah. a, that's a real life situation. It is. And you know, Ephesians 5 uh, in all throughout that chapter is really a whole chapter on being submitted and authority over us and, and have authority. And being submitted to the authority. But let me tell you something, uh, God never wants us to, to submit to something that's ungodly. Mm -hmm. And so when we're submitted to authority, for instance, the Bible says, children obey your parents in the Lord. So if your parents are, are not uh, Christians and they're coming against you and they're saying things, they're, they're asking you to do something that is not godly, it's not scriptural, uh, you can love them and you can honor them, but you do not have to obey them in, in asking you to do something that's sinful. Right? So it's important for us to keep our hearts in the right place when we're in these challenging moments. And when words are spoken against you, you know, it, one of the most painful uh, times that happens is through family. Yeah. When family speaks words against you, whether it's your parents or your siblings or, you know, an aunt and uncle, whoever it happens to be, when it's family, the reason why it hurts more is because we care. And because we value those people in our lives. So separate the person from what's being said. Amen. The Bible says that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers in high places. Listen, all these demonic influences play themselves <laughs> out through conversations, even from well-meaning people. This is why Jesus did what he did with Peter. Peter was one of his closest disciples. And yet when Peter was speaking something that was not scripture, it was not in agreement with the will of God, Jesus was able to separate that from Peter and speak to the spirit that was operating behind Peter. So love the people, you know, uh, and, and realize that what they're saying is coming from a place of brokenness and sin in their lives. And I believe it's going to help you to be able to recover from those words that are being hurtful and spoken into your life. Don't receive them from them, but rather just let them go right past you over to the cross of Christ and let the one who's greater in you take what those words were meaning as harm. Yeah. Take them. Take them right. Jesus says, I'll take it. Cast it over on me. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Uh, so live your blessed life on YouTube says, how do you know if you have bowed to something besides God? How do you know? Here's how you know, because it's influencing your heart. Mm. It's influencing how you think. 
And when you discover an area of your life that's contrary to scripture, the, the quickest thing to do is to recognize it and submit it and say, you know what? It is written. I'm going to go with the word of God, not this. But when something is influencing your heart that's contrary to scripture, that's how you know you've been listening to the wrong thing, you've been seeing the wrong thing, and you've been thinking the wrong thing. And you know what? Here's the thing. We don't need to condemn ourselves over these processes because this is something that's going to be lifelong for us. We are in the process of being restored and being renewed in the area of our will, our mind, and our emotions. Mm -hmm. Everything that's in our soul realm is a lifelong process of recognizing, oh, that's wrong. <laughs> I've not been thinking correctly in that area. So instead of con condemnation and condemning yourself, just simply submit it to the Word of God and go with what is written versus what the old familiar pattern has been. And what's going to happen is you're not going to be conformed to the ways of the world in that area any longer, but you're going to begin to experience transformation in your life, just like Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about. Amen. And yeah, I think the whole beginning stage of that is realizing you've bowed to something. So that's, yeah. that's the very first step. That's the very first step. And I love how you say that. If it has influence over you, that yeah. means you've bowed to it. That's right. Praise God. Yep. Whether it's to God or not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for years, I didn't know that it was scriptural for me to be healed. Yeah. Just as an example, right. you know, it doesn't have to be something that is the typical scenario that we often think of, like drugs and, and you know, alcohol or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it could simply be an area of unbelief where we've been thinking wrongly about something and now we submit it to the Word of God and we experience transformation as a result. Amen. So just along those lines, that's really good that you just brought it up like that. Samaya so on YouTube says, based on this timely topic, I have bowed to fear and it has a stronghold on me. Mm. How can I gain my boldness and authority to break free from the chain and slavery of fear? Boy, that's a big one. And right? Samaya, you know what? You're not alone. There's a lot of people right now who are really dealing with fear. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know from scripture that perfect love casts out all fear. But here's the thing, you know, it's knowing that you're perfectly loved, mm. okay? It's not just perfect love over here by itself. It's, it's realizing that God is love and he's perfect love. But you know what? He loves you perfectly. And when you begin to realize that you've let an area of your life be submitted to that fear instead of to that perfect love, once you recognize that, then you have the authority to speak to the fear and to tell it to get out. And when you renew your mind to the word of God, that fear will continually become more and, and more in the back seat of your life to where it literally just falls off and disappears. You know, areas where people used to be just really fearful years ago, even myself included, now aren't even an issue. I don't even think about it anymore because I've so renewed my mind to the word of God, but it was a process and I had to get rid of that old way of thinking and those old patterns that had become so established in my life. And you know, fear works just like faith works. You know, faith comes by hearing. Well, so does fear. Now, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, where fear comes by hearing and by hearing everything else but the word of God. And so when you have fear in your life, go back and ask yourself, okay, what have I been listening to? What have I been submitting to? What have I been bowing to in my life? And when you recognize it, like Julianne and I were just saying, you can begin to change that pattern by submitting it to the word and to the spirit of God. And here's the thing, guys, the Spirit of God is our helper. Amen. He loves to help us. He wants to help us. He's available right now to help us to be conformed, not to the image of the world, but to be conformed to the image of Christ. He is so jealous over us to be conformed to that image that he is literally on standby right now to help you to be conformed to that image instead of the image of brokenness. Amen. Praise God. Wow, that's so good. I can't wait to go back and watch this again. Amen. There's so much in it, you guys, and I would encourage you guys to re-watch these and be encouraged by it. And right now, I know some of you, maybe you're going through something or maybe you just had an aha moment, mm -hmm. a word from God saying, yeah. 
you are bowing to something that, that you don't need to. Amen. Because you're victorious over all of it. I would encourage you right now to give our prayer ministers a call at 719-635-1111. And then they can give you further detail uh, towards the word of God, get you mm -hmm. some supplemental teaching. And you guys, it's a day and an hour for us to live in victory. It's true. Right? Yeah. We're the salt and the light of That's the right. earth. Yeah. And if we're not salty, yeah. if we're not shining, yep. Yeah, how are they going to see and how are they going to know? Amen. See, we are the body of Christ yeah. in the earth today. Amen. You know, that's we're it. we're Jesus with skin on. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Some of us don't resemble it, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know about the forty-day fast thing that Jesus did. Well, maybe, you know, maybe I'll one day get that holy. I don't know. <laughs> so, anyways, you guys, we're coming down to an end. I just want to remind you, we have Relationship University at one p.m. Mountain Time today. We also have Truth and Liberty tonight at six p.m. and and don't forget, we have Tuesday night live Bible study on uh, tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Yeah. And that's all mountain time. Anytime we mention times here, it's on uh, mountain time. So thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you for joining us this yes. morning. It's always a, a blessing and a pleasure to be able to be here with you. Thank you. Amen. And we'll see you all next time. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. I want to let you know that we're moving all of our live stream productions of Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College to our gospeltruth.tv format. We have a lot of teaching there, not only of myself, but many other people. But now we're moving all of the live streams there. So if you ever want to watch any live stream that we are producing, the place to go is gospeltruth.tv for all of our live streaming as well as our regular programming. You will be blessed.